we've searched for MH370 before, not just a little, over 120,000 square kilometers of ocean floor, autonomous underwater vehicles, side scan, sonar, years of work by some of the most capable search teams on the planet. So when you hear about a new search, the natural reaction is to ask, why again? Didn't we already look? But that's not actually the most important question. The better questions are these. What does it really mean to search an area this large? How can a careful, well-funded effort still come up empty? And what, realistically, has changed enough to make another search worth taking seriously? That's what this video is about. My name is William, and welcome to Black Box Analysts. And if this is your first time here, consider subscribing for the latest aviation updates and explanation. Now let's dive in. When people hear that the MH370 search covered roughly 120,000 square kilometers, there's an assumption baked into that number. The assumption is that this area was somehow seen in full detail, that every square meter of seabed was carefully examined, almost like scanning a photograph. That's not how deep ocean searching works. Most of the underwater search relied on side scan sonar. All that means is that the vehicle sends sound waves out to the sides and listens for the echoes that bounce back. It's a very effective tool, but it doesn't give you a wide, continuous picture. It gives you narrow strips of data stitched together over time as the vehicle moves along its track. How much detail you get depends on several things at once. How high the vehicle is above the seabed, how fast it's moving, how rough the terrain is underneath it. Change any one of those, and the quality of the picture changes as well. So when we talk about coverage, we're really talking about probability, not certainty. There's also a limitation that almost never gets discussed outside technical circles. Side scan sonar has a blind spot directly beneath the vehicle. It's called the nadir gap. Think of it like shining a flashlight sideways while standing on a ladder. You're lighting up the walls, but there's a strip of floor directly under you that never quite gets illuminated. Unless the search pattern overlaps that gap perfectly, objects in that zone can go unnoticed. Now add terrain into the picture. The seafloor in the MH370 search area isn't flat. It's steep, broken, and irregular, with ridges, slopes, and deep valleys. Those features create acoustic shadows, areas where the sound simply doesn't reach because something else is in the way. A piece of wreckage sitting in the wrong spot on the wrong slope can be effectively invisible from certain angles. So when someone says they passed right over that area, that doesn't automatically mean the seabed in that area was clearly observed. Passing over and detecting are two very different things. There's another assumption that quietly shapes expectations. And that's the idea of what the wreckage would look like. Many people picture an intact fuselage resting neatly on the ocean floor. In reality, an impact at cruise speed is far more likely to produce a scattered debris field. Smaller pieces, irregular shapes, objects that don't stand out cleanly from the surrounding geology. Sonar is very good at spotting large, simple shapes that don't belong. It's much less effective when the target is broken up, partially buried, or similar in size and texture to the environment around it. In that situation, debris doesn't jump out at you. It blends in. So this is the first thing to keep in mind as we move forward. In deep water, saying we searched it doesn't mean what most people think it means. It means we applied the best tools we had within real world limits, and accepted a level of uncertainty that's easy to forget after the fact. This isn't the first time the aviation or maritime world has faced a search that seemed thorough, expensive, and ultimately unsuccessful, until it wasn't. If you look at cases like Air France, Flight 447, the USS Scorpion, or even 19th century shipwrecks like the SS Central America, a pattern starts to emerge. In each case, there was early confidence that the search area was well-defined. In each case, the initial efforts came up empty. And in each case, the breakthrough didn't come from simply doing more of the same. What changed wasn't effort, it was thinking. Take Air France 447. Multiple sonar passes failed to locate the wreckage, even though the aircraft was eventually found relatively close to earlier search zones. What made the difference was a willingness to revisit assumptions about how the aircraft entered the water, how debris behaved afterward, and how probability was being interpreted. Bayesian reanalysis didn't magically reveal the wreck, but it reshaped where people were willing to look. That's a subtle but important distinction. The successful searches didn't happen because someone got lucky. They happened because the search teams accepted that their earlier models might be incomplete or even wrong in key ways. Once that door was opened, new areas became reasonable instead of unthinkable. 
MH370 fits that same pattern uncomfortably well. The early search leaned heavily on satellite handshake data and assumptions about the aircraft's behavior at the end of the flight. Those assumptions weren't unreasonable, but over time they hardened into something closer to certainty. Search zones were narrowed, probability, contours became boundaries. Areas outside those lines quietly became less interesting. That's how probability slowly turns into belief. The lesson from past impossible finds is not that technology failed or that people weren't trying hard enough. It's that wrecks aren't found when we simply push forward. They're found when we step back and ask whether the model guiding the search still deserves our confidence. That question is uncomfortable, but historically it's also been necessary. Up to this point, it's been tempting to think of the ocean floor as a kind of frozen snapshot. An aircraft hits the water, sinks, and whatever is left simply stays where it lands, waiting to be found. That assumption feels intuitive. It's also misleading. One of the uncomfortable realities of the MH370 search is that large portions of the seabed were not well understood before the search even began. Only about 27% of the global ocean floor has been mapped with modern high-resolution sonar, as of mid-2025. In the MH370 search area, some of the available maps before the search were based on sparse data, sometimes with resolution measured in kilometers, not meters. In other words, teams were often flying their vehicles over terrain that was only loosely understood. As the search progressed, much of that area was mapped in detail for the first time. That alone tells you something important. The search wasn't just about finding wreckage. In many places, it was also about discovering what the seafloor actually looked like. When your map is still being drawn, interpreting sonar returns becomes more complex because you're trying to separate geology from anything that might be man-made. Depth adds another layer of difficulty. The MH370 search area ranged from relatively shallow depths of a few hundred meters to regions more than 6,000 meters deep. At those depths, the seafloor isn't smooth. It's steep, broken, and dynamic. There are ridges, trenches, sediment flows, and abrupt slopes that create natural traps where objects can collect or disappear from view. And the ocean doesn't stop working once the wreckage reaches the bottom. Bottom currents exist even at great depth. They're slow, but over time, they matter. Debris can slide down slope. Pieces can migrate into basins. Fine sediment can gradually cover exposed objects. This doesn't happen overnight, but it doesn't take centuries either. Over time, Sharp edges soften, shapes blur, and what once looked clearly artificial starts to resemble the surrounding terrain. That leads to an uncomfortable thought. The longer wreckage remains underwater, the harder it can become to distinguish from the environment around it. Not because it's gone, but because the ocean is very good at blending things in. This is why treating the seabed like a fixed crime scene can lead to false confidence. The ocean doesn't preserve evidence. It actively reshapes and hides it. Any new search has to account for that reality, not work against it. At this point, it's natural to hear the word AI and expect either a miracle or a marketing pitch. Neither of those reactions is very helpful. Artificial intelligence does not magically find wrecks. It doesn't replace sonar systems, and it certainly doesn't replace human judgment. What it does well is something far more specific and far less dramatic. AI is good at recognizing patterns across very large data sets, especially patterns that humans tend to overlook or mentally filter out. That matters in a search like MH370 because enormous amounts of sonar data already exist. That data was reviewed by skilled analysts, but it was reviewed through the lens of expectations formed at the time. Every analyst, no matter how experienced, carries assumptions about what they're likely to see. Over long hours of reviewing similar imagery, the human brain becomes very good at discarding anything that doesn't seem to fit. That's not a flaw, it's how we function. But it does mean that subtle, low confidence anomalies can be passed over without realizing it. This is where AI can contribute in a meaningful way, not by declaring, here is the wreck, but by asking quieter questions. Does this shape repeat elsewhere? Does this cluster of returns behave differently from the surrounding terrain? Are there geometric inconsistencies that don't quite match known geology? Modern search vehicles add another piece to this puzzle. Today's autonomous underwater vehicles can operate down to roughly 6,000 meters and carry more advanced sensors than were widely available a decade ago. Synthetic aperture sonar, for example, can produce higher resolution images by combining multiple passes coherently. 
Multi-beam bathymetry and backscatter analysis add context that wasn't always available in earlier searches. AI helps make sense of that richer data. It can help re-rank areas that deserve a second look, especially areas that were previously dismissed as low probability. Importantly, it doesn't decide what the wreck should look like. It simply highlights places where the data doesn't behave the way we expect it to. In that sense, AI doesn't replace human judgment. It challenges it. It forces us to revisit assumptions we may not even realize we're making. Technology and environment explain a lot, but they don't explain everything. To understand why MH370 wasn't found, we also have to look at the human and institutional pressures surrounding a search of this scale. Large searches don't exist in a vacuum. They're shaped by budgets, political realities, and public expectations. There is always pressure to define an endpoint, to eventually say, this is as far as we can reasonably go. That pressure isn't malicious, it's structural. As time passes, fatigue sets in. Funding becomes harder to justify. The demand for closure grows louder. Under those conditions, narrowing the search feels responsible even when uncertainty remains. There's also the issue of confirmation bias. Early models and assumptions naturally influence how later data is interpreted. Once a particular theory becomes widely accepted, contradictory information tends to receive more scrutiny, not less. Expanding the search outside accepted boundaries becomes institutionally difficult because it implies that earlier decisions might have been incomplete. Organizations prefer clarity, they prefer defined goals and measurable outcomes. MH370, by its nature, resists that. It requires comfort with ambiguity and a willingness to say, we still don't know. That's an uncomfortable position for any large operation to occupy indefinitely. So when we talk about why past searches failed, it's not about incompetence or neglect. It's about how humans and institutions respond to uncertainty. MH370 wasn't lost because the ocean was too big. It was lost because certainty arrived too early and uncertainty became harder to tolerate over time. So is this new search genuinely different or is it just repeating history? In some important ways, it is different. We have better seabed knowledge than before. We have more capable sensors. We have the ability to reprocess existing data with fresh tools and fewer assumptions. Perhaps most importantly, there's a greater willingness to admit what we don't know. That doesn't mean success is guaranteed. Time still works against us. Environmental degradation continues. The ocean hasn't become any smaller or simpler, but the mindset has shifted. The focus is less on proving a specific theory and more on questioning the framework that guided earlier decisions. That alone changes how a search unfolds. And this matters beyond MH370. It affects how we approach future searches, future accidents, and future unknowns. It shapes how willing we are to revisit our conclusions when the evidence doesn't quite line up. So the final question isn't whether another search is justified. It's whether we've learned enough from past failures to search differently this time. Do you think MH370 was missed because we didn't search enough or because we searched with too much confidence in the wrong assumptions? That's a question worth sitting with. So what do you think? Let me see your thoughts about this in the comment and we'll discuss together. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Fly safe.